When it comes to a relationship with God, is the Bible the only thing that we need? Or do we need other books, other tools to understand God better and what He wants from us? This is Faithful to the Scripture, and today we're going to study the Sola Scriptura Principle. Our two guests are Richard Davidson, Professor of Old Testament Interpretation at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University, and John Peckham, Professor of Theology and Christian Philosophy at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews as well. So get your Bibles, get a notebook, and join the conversation. Richard and John, I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having Thank you. us. The Sola Scriptura principle is foundational for Protestant Christian doctrine. Could you explain us what is uh, the meaning of this principle and why is it so important? Yes, the term Sola Scriptura is a Latin term and mm -hmm. it comes from the time of the Protestant Reformation and it was actually one of the, the rallying cries of the reformers. Mm -hmm. In the, in the Reformation times. It's, it's one of three, at least three, solas. There mm. was sola fide, mm -hmm. by faith alone. There was sola gratia, by mm. grace alone. And then sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Mm. And in the time of the Reformation, the reformers realized they needed to stop depending upon a tradition or science or other forms of authority as the final authority and that scripture, scripture needed to be mm. the foundation of the whole theological and biblical enterprise that they engaged in. And so uh, such passages as Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 gives us the idea of the sola scriptura principle, scripture alone as the final, the final test. Uh, I'm reading Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. To the law, that's to the Torah, yep. and to the testimony, that's mm -hmm. the prophets that referred back to the Torah. If they don't speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Mm -hmm. Or some versions say because there's no dawn for them. And so scripture becomes the foundation for everything else. So this is a very important uh, change because they have simplified in some sense uh, the, uh, the, uh, our understanding of revelation. Now why is this really important? Yes, well uh, I actually found it, I can tell you from my own experience why it's yes. important because I was once operating without realizing it on a principle of letting other things be above scripture, my mm. reason above scripture or something else. And, and when I woke up at a, a Bible conference, actually, mm. that was sponsored by our, our Adventist church mm -hmm. and realized that scripture was not the foundation for me, mm. then I saw that my whole ed edifice, my whole building yes. of doctrine and of, and of experience and everything was grounded in something in me rather than in God's word. Yes. And I, I had a, a conversion experience and I was converted back to the, to the principle of the reformers, which is really a biblical principle of, of scripture alone as the foundation for my faith. So in some sense, uh, it's putting the Bible and God on the foundation of things instead of our thinking or, or other th human things that we can bring to our Bible study. That's right. Yes, and, and I think that some people struggle with the concept of sola scriptura, especially in contemporary theology, because they take it to mean more than what is intended by mm. it, actually. And so I think it's important to highlight some things that, that we don't mean when we say sola scriptura. Okay. When we say sola scriptura, we don't mean that, that every point of theology must be derived verbatim from a biblical passage, okay. but it should be appropriately derived because the Bible is the sufficient ground for can, our doctrine. Can you explain a little bit what is verbatim? Verbatim, but word for word, yes. Okay. It, you don't have to have a quote word for word text for every single thing that you say. Although what you say should be able to be grounded and derived from scripture 
doctrinally. Now here we could make an important distinction, distinction between theological doctrine and some ecclesial practices. Mm. The Bible doesn't address all the specific questions we would ask about our church life. Now we shouldn't be too quick to assume that the Bible doesn't address it or doesn't address it as, as uh, directly as we would like. But in some cases, some ecclesial practices will have to be made on the basis of biblical principles, but even going beyond biblical principles. I think for doctrine, we have an even higher threshold. Now, yeah. another thing that, that Sola Scriptura does not mean is it does not mean that uh, we do not use our reason. We have to use our reason, of course, but it means that our reason is always subjected to the canon of Scripture. We mm. do not sit in judgment over and against the scripture. So it's a receptive reason rather than a criticizing reason. Exactly, yes. that's right. Yeah. So you can't not use reason, yeah. but you're not using it as authoritative. Yeah. That is a very interesting, a very important distinction. Now you mentioned that for ecclesial practices, we may not have all the biblical evidence we mm -hmm. may want. Yes. Could you give some examples of what an ecclesial practice is? Yeah, so uh, ecclesial practices, some of the things that we do in the church life, uh, maybe a particular question about our worship service mm. and what should be included or not included. I think there are, are biblical principles that we have to abide by, yes. but the text doesn't necessarily tell us about every single point. That's just one example. Or the order, for example. Right, the order of service, yes. what is included, what, what time of the Sabbath we go, all of these things don't come directly out of Scripture. And there's a number of things in our church manual that are good practices, but they don't come from Scripture alone nor would, would that uh, particular doctrine require that. Now, a couple other things that we shouldn't think Sola Scriptura means. It doesn't mean that my interpretation of Scripture, my private interpretation mm. of Scripture, is the one that should base theology. We have to be willing to listen to others, not as if they are an authority, all in under the authority of Scripture, uh, and that way we can learn from the Bible together. Mm. I would also widen it slightly mm -hmm. to say that Sola Scriptura is not just how we study the Bible. Sola Scriptura really means that the Bible is the foundation, it is the perspective, the divine perspective for all of life, hmm. for every, uh, every discipline, every branch of knowledge and so, experience. So not only theology, That's but right. also biology and That's right. all other sciences. Even though it's not a yeah. scientific textbook, Nonetheless, it provides the divine perspective, mm -hmm. the world view, okay. yes. with which we have as a lens to look at all of life. Theologians also speak about the tota scriptura principle and the prima scriptura principle. How do they relate to the sola scriptura principle? And are these principles really necessary? Martin Luther consciously accepted the sola scriptura principle. Mm -hmm but I don't think he ever grasped the tota scriptura principle. By tota scriptura, we mean by the totality of scripture. And while Martin Luther sought to make the Bible the foundation, he still looked at some parts of the Bible as not quite so important as others, or maybe not so inspired as others. He looked at the epistle of James as a, an epistle of straw, yeah. and the book of Revelation he sort of put down, and then he had the law and the gospel, the law mm -hmm. parts of the Bible were not so important. So he kind of made a canon within a canon, those things which were important, which weren't. And this is very interesting because for some Christians, probably the Psalms is what is important, and for others, are special books in the Bible. Yes. But when you go to scripture itself, it urges us to take the totality of what it says about any given topic or subject or theme. Uh, and a key passage for that is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture hmm. is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped in every good work. Not just some of scripture, but all scripture. Mm. And Jesus exemplified this on the road to Emmaus, the day that he was resurrected. And yes. he opened the scriptures in Luke 24. We read how in all the scriptures, he opened and showed them the things concerning himself. And it actually mentions the, the, the three parts of Old Testament scripture, the yes. Torah and, the, and prophets. the prophets and the writings, the Psalms. So Jesus gave us an example mm. of tota scriptura. Yes, and I think the use of prima scriptura, we have to be careful as to what we mean and what we may not mean with that kind of phrase. And 
really when theologians use it, they may be meaning very different things. Uh, one dangerous way of speaking of prima scriptura is that some theologians suggest that uh, other sources of knowledge should have their own sphere and whatever they say is authoritative and then scripture has its own theory and some, some its own sphere. Sometimes they make this fact versus value distinction. This is very problematic. It's like so saying that scripture is good for salvation, but when it comes to, to medicine, comes to other things, right. scripture doesn't have anything to say about that. That's right. And so this can be very problematic. Uh, there, there's another way that, that we, can, we can recognize what is the positive value of what some people mean by prima scriptura. They mean to say that, that we recognize that the Bible teaches that there is revelation that is included in the canon of scripture, mm -hmm. but there's also general revelation. Mm -hmm. The heavens declare the glory okay. of God. This is true, we affirm this. Yes. And if we believe in sola scriptura, we have to also believe mm -hmm. that there is revelation outside of scripture. But scripture itself is the authoritative revelation mm -hmm. through which any other revelation and any other sources must be viewed. Now, many that take a prima scriptura uh, perspective, they also will elevate other sources, typically tradition, mm. reason, and experience. And here again, I think it's important to draw our attention to the way that the scripture relates to these principles, which undergirds what we mean by sola scriptura. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 19 through 20, sa states that the wisdom of this world is foolishness mm. before God. And the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. So our reason must be subordinate to the scripture. And then with regard to both our reason and our experience, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, so it's th throw, throw in there Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right yes. to a man, but the way thereof are the, are the ways of death. That's right. So, so, so you've mentioned tradition, mm -hmm. philosophy could yes. be put into Colossians yes. Chapter, yes. chapter 2, verses 8, yes. and uh, reason, tradition, philosophy, experience, That's right. science. Yes. In those days it was gnosis, yes. the, the Gnostic science, which uh, was put above scripture. That's right. And, and Christ addresses the uh, elevating of the traditions of men yeah. over the Bible specifically. He talks about this in Matthew 15, where he says the word of God and the commandment of God, tradition must be subjected to them, and that those who elevated tradition were invalidating mm. the word of God in doing so. And we can't forget the words of Peter as well. We ought to obey God rather yeah. than men in Acts 5. So if we believe in scripture, we need also to believe in the claim that scripture makes, that scripture is above everything else That's right. uh, as it comes to know and the it's truth. it's uniquely sufficient. Everything else is fallible, hmm. including my own reason and my own interpretation and all of the wisdom of the world. But God's word is infallible. Hmm. Where this came home to me personally mm -hmm. was when I heard a sermon, uh, a study given on uh, Adam and Eve before hmm. they fell. Hmm. Eve at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. and the serpent was lisping his lies about God, mm -hmm. and she started using her reason. Mm -hmm. She started using her aesthetic uh, sensibility. She started applying empirical uh, evidence, uh, yes. doing some scientific mm. testing, the, f the fruit, you know, all of this. And she ended up falling, choosing the serpent's words rather yes. than the word of God. Mm. And that was a big mistake. Yes, this is yes. a cautionary tale for us. Yeah. Now, in view of what we have been discussing, what is the role of Ellen G. White in matters of doctrine, devotional life, and the life of the church? Yes, we believe that, that Ellen White was a true prophet because she met the biblical tests mm -hmm. of being a prophet. But any prophet outside of scripture has to be tested by scripture mm -hmm. and also subordinated to scripture. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the way that Ellen White uh, presents her own ministry. And she actually supports sola scriptura in saying, among other things, the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith. Mm. That's in the Review and Herald, 1938. Elsewhere in the Review and Herald in 1885, uh, eight, she says, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed, the sole bond of our union. Mm. In another place, she says, I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. 
God has in that word promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from the Bible truth. Can I add one more from uh, Great Controversy, page 595? My favorite one on this subject. Mm. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines, as the basis of all reforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. Ellen G. White asserts that the Bible is the most important, the only source of, of, of doctrine for us That's now. Right, yeah. If that is correct, what would uh, be her role in, in, in view of the importance or the, or, the, or the sola scriptura principle? One metaphor that she liked to use was mm -hmm. the light metaphor, that she mm -hmm. was the lesser light to lead us to the greater light. Another time she, she wrote that because little heed is given to the Bible, mm -hmm. God has given us this prophetic gift to, to call us back to study mm -hmm. the Bible. And so she, she never intended for her writings to be a substitute for deep digging into the Word. So in that sense, uh, her ministry is calling us back to right. God's original purpose. Yeah, she tells us the treasures are down deep in God's Word, yeah. to dig deeper and deeper still. Mm -hmm. Among other things, she tells us that the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith. And that's from Councils on Sabbath School Work, page 84. So she was in that, in that expression, she, she was including herself as well. That's right. I think she's explicitly talking about her own ministry and any others who would, who would claim. So when we have our devotional life, then we should go to the scriptures. That's right. But if we use also energy white, which is a, it's a good thing, we should use it only as far as she can lead us back mm -hmm. to, 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 the, to the understanding of the Word of God. Yep. And that happens when you, when you study scripture. And I, I in really enjoy reading through the Bible and then reading through Ellen White's Conflict of the Ages series, mm -hmm. which is her devotional commentary on the, on the whole story of, mm -hmm. of the Bible and the whole rest of the salvation history. And as you read the biblical material and then you read her, uh, her exposition of it and then especially her application mm -hmm. of it to your personal life, you just feel strangely warmed mm -hmm. and you feel like the Bible is coming alive mm -hmm. and she's not drawing you away from the Bible. She's mm -hmm. just drawing you back into the mm -hmm. Word in a, in a marvelous way. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, and, and I think it's very important uh, that we actually study the Word of God and read Ellen White through the Bible rather than the other way around. Yeah. I think uh, many people have problems in understanding Ellen White because they don't dig deeply into the Word, but you will understand her through the Bible. And I think many misunderstandings of what she is saying is because of an unbiblical perspective that is brought to her writings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when we study the Bible, we also uh, can use commentaries, uh, Bible dictionaries, and other tools, uh, other books that sometimes help us uh, to understand the biblical text. What should be our attitude to, this, to these uh, books? Should we use them, or is it wrong to use them? Yes, I, I think that if we're going to dig deeply into the Bible, we should make good use and judicious use of many of the sources that are available to us, especially here in the 21st century. But I think that in, in doing so, we need to make a careful distinction about uh, how Sola Scriptura actually can be applied. I make a distinction between what I call dis descriptive Sola Scriptura and prescriptive Sola Scriptura. And what I mean by that is that none of us come to the Bible without some presuppositions, without having heard, whether it's from our pastor at church or from the reading of a commentary or even from our tradition. And we have ideas already that we need to be conscious of and recognize that descriptively we're always influenced by many factors, sometimes very positively, sometimes perhaps more negatively. And so prescriptively we should be intentionally seeking all the time to subordinate everything we're bringing, everything we're hearing to the Word of God. And we have to do this also with all the tools that we use because they may also be influenced by presuppositions or views that we would not want to accept. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from them. So this is a very important uh, uh, aspect that you have mentioned. We need to be aware that of the things that we, we are not empty. Our, ha our minds have uh, previous ideas That's that right. may color what we see. And yes. the same happens with the books. So that should inform the way we use them. Right. 
and, and we can never get to the point where these are not influencing us, which is why we have to be even more conscious, try to recognize mm -hmm. not only other people's presuppositions, but, but what am I bringing to the text? Mm -hmm. What can I subject to the Word of God? I think we need to remember what was mentioned in an earlier question, mm -hmm. that sola scriptura does not mean that we only use the Bible right. and okay. you don't look at any other book. Mm -hmm. That's not what it means. It means which, which is the one that is foundational to everything else. Yes. And so I read commentaries, I read uh, Bible dictionaries, I read every source that I can possibly get that can illuminate the Bible, but as I'm reading them, they are not the ones that are the authority over the Word. Mm -hmm. I'm always asking myself, are they writing in harmony with the Word? or not in harmony with the word. So I, I, I read with a little bit of suspicion, a healthy suspicion. Yes. 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 But when I read scripture, I don't have to have any of that suspicion. You have confidence. I can have absolute confidence. And so I actually take as my guiding light, my guiding text that I think summarize best of all the sola scriptura principle, this text in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse two where I read, for all those things my hand has made, all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles hmm. at my word. Hmm. So I'm always asking myself when I come to scripture, am I sitting in judgment on God's word or am I trembling at his word? I don't tremble at the commentaries. Yeah. I don't tremble at all these other authorities. But when I come to his word, I tremble. And I put my reason, my everything underneath. And as much as the presuppositions that I have, I put underneath. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to help me to accept the biblical presuppositions and the biblical worldview and to remove my faults mm -hmm biases and prejudices, yes. and the Spirit's been promised to do that. So yes. we need to be very humble when we come to the Word of God. That's right. And nothing can be the normative interpreter. I can't be the normative interpreter, and there's no other source, whether it's yeah. tradition or even very good biblical commentaries and lexicons that can give a normative interpretation. The Bible has to be allowed to interpret itself. Yeah. So I like to illustrate it this way. Here's the Bible. Okay. Am I going to be up here? judging the Bible? the Bible? okay. Or is the Bible going to be up here judging me and I'm trembling? Not with terror, mm. trembling with reverence mm. because here's the sacred word of truth there that's showing us the way to salvation. Now there is a very interesting phenomenon when it comes to the Old Testament. We have three versions of the Old Testament. We have the Septuagint, we have the Masoretic text, and we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. How do we relate to these different versions of the Old Testament? Which one is the scripture? Yes, let's define those three ver uh, versions. We, let's start with the MT, the mm -hmm. Masoretic text. And this is actually the text that was handed down from generation to generation through the Middle Ages by the Masoretes, the mm. Jewish scholars who were preserving. Mm -hmm. They actually memorized most mm. of the Bible and memorized how to pronounce it. And around the fifth to the seventh century AD, they added even punctuation marks because the original Hebrew text didn't have any, any punctuation. They added vowel markings. They mm -hmm. added uh, uh, cantillation mm -hmm. accent marks mm -hmm. so that you could you could say it like it should be said mm -hmm. and read it and even sing it, mm -hmm. uh, cantillate it. And so these, uh, these Masoretes developed this wonderful system of not only in the text, but writing these remarks on the outsides of, outside of the text in the margins, uh, their, uh, their notations. And we have whole manuscripts that go back to around 900 AD. And uh, these, these texts form the basis of the, our modern uh, Hebrew Bibles. Yes. Unlike the New Testament, you have all these hundreds of mm -hmm. different manuscripts that mm -hmm. you have to collate and figure out yes. which one is the original. Well, we we yes. basically just have the Masoretic text, mm -hmm. which is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. the, they, the Masoretes brought it down mm -hmm. with very little, uh, very little difference among yes. the different manuscripts. 
the Dead Sea Scrolls is very significant in, in confirming that, isn't it? Exactly. So uh, we, we find the critical scholars, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they have a, a whole raft of conjectured emendations mm. to the Masoretic text in the poetry sections because it didn't quite match with what they thought. And then 1947 comes and there in the, in the caves surrounding Qumran, west of the Dead Sea, this little boy you know, who could tell the whole story finds, drops a, a stone into a cave and hears the smattering of the potsherd there, the, the pottery breaking apart. And lo and behold, they find cave after cave after cave mm -hmm. of hundreds, thousands of scrolls, some of them in one piece, some of them in lots of pieces. But what they found, as you just pointed out, was here's the Isaiah scroll, 1Q Isaiah, mm -hmm. that is a, an entire scroll, identical, mm. virtually identical, word for word, wow. line for line, letter for letter, to the Isaiah scroll of the Masoretic text. And here, the Dead Sea Scrolls were from the third century BC down to the first century AD, virtually a thousand years earlier. Mm -hmm. And it shows that these Masoretes were keeping these texts faithful mm. for a thousand years. So the biblical text of the Dead Sea Scrolls is almost identical to the, um, to the Masoretic text. That's right. Uh, yes, we, and if it comes from the third century BC to the first century, this is basically the text that Jesus would have had in Hebrew. Exactly. And we have examples of all of these texts all of the Bible, the Bible books of the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. Mm -hmm. So we have really representatives of the whole mm -hmm. thing. But now some of the Dead Sea Scrolls follow the Septuagint, and we need to add that third piece mm -hmm. in here. The Septuagint was the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that was made uh, probably in Alexandria mm -hmm. in northern Egypt uh, to help out for Jews that had left their homeland and didn't know Hebrew anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they translated the Hebrew into Greek for these Greek-speaking Jews. Mm -hmm. And some suggest that it might have also been written in order to show the Greeks that they have also a scripture like the Greeks have their ancient mm -hmm. stuff, so they've got their ancient stuff. But the Greek text is helpful in that it, it shows us a, an early translation of the Hebrew Bible and in some cases uh, where maybe a copyist has made an, a mistake in the Hebrew text, the Greek text can help us to uh, bring those together. And so the Greek text is not the original. The Hebrew it was all written in Hebrew, the Old Testament, but the Greek translation is helpful in comparison to help us establish sometimes when there's questions about what the original one was. So God has been faithful to preserve his word. It's amazing. <laughs>